So it's very significant that in making his observations, Darwin looked at the world, the real world, in its process of change, of development. And once he did that, he was then able to tap into some of these other branches of science and use those to back up the discoveries that he was making with his work. Uh, he wasn't particularly a, a great scholar. Um, his career was not really going very far at all. Um, there was the idea of him going into the church, but that didn't last for very long. And um, he didn't have to worry too much because um, he was a member of the, the bourgeois ruling class. He wasn't an entrepreneurial capitalist, but um, his father um, had means and he himself never had to work. And he received at that, in the, at that time something like £15,000 on his marriage. His wife got a dowry of about £5,000 and when his father died he got another forty odd thousand. Um, and that was quite enough for him never to have to work. And not only was he able to live on the investment income, but um, by, the, by the end of his life he left uh, an estate of very much more than that, having invested quite a lot of money in the, in the railways, which did very well over that period because they were superseding at that time the canals. So that was Darwin's own personal background, but the only significance of that to us, I believe, is that it left him, as, as we know, um, uh, division of labour, exploitation, leaves some members of society able to engage with study, and it left him able to engage with study. So that when he had the good fortune of being offered a berth on um, an admiralty ship called the Beagle, which I'm sure you've all heard about, the voyage of the Beagle, um, he was able to take that up. He wasn't paid, um, but he went on that ship as a scientist. The ship itself, the, the main purpose of the voyages of the Beagle were mapping for the benefit of both the merchant and the, um, uh, and the fighting fleet of, uh, of Britain. But um, they took along with them um, Darwin and this about five years on, on the Beagle and he had um, the occasion to stop in some places for many weeks and sometimes months able to collect organisms um, to, to take back but also to observe what he saw and his observations were very wide ranging I'm not going to give you a, a biological um, lesson in, in, all, in all the things that Darwin saw, but I will refer to some of them. And the most famous um, are the Galapagos finches. You heard about the Galapagos finches? Darwin was very, very interested in the animals and plants that occurred on the Galapagos Islands, not least because they were so remote from the mainland and so difficult to get at. And he observed that among the birds on the Galapagos Islands, there were finches. And what was strange about these finches was that there were quite a lot of different types. One of them very much resembled the ground finch of the mainland of South America. Um, a typical finch, a seed-eating bird that had, was a, had a little stocky build and, and a broad beak for crushing seeds, the, the seeds that it ate. Um, rather like, not, not dissimilar in shape to a, a common house sparrow or a, or a chaffinch, that type of bird. But what he noticed was that there were other finches there which were clearly finches, but which were nothing like what he'd seen on the mainland. There were, in addition to this ground finch, four types of finch which lived up in the trees off the ground, and they were insect eaters rather than seed eaters. There was one that lived in the trees that, well, that ate buds. Um, there was another that looked very like what he knew as a warbler from um, his native England. Had a much, much more slender bill, very suitable for eating insects and also, like warblers, it actually caught insects on the wing flying about. No other 
finch that he'd ever seen before behaved like that. And there was even a very remarkable one called a, a woodpecker finch, which had a very strong and tough bill and had developed the ability to run vertically up tree trunks, hammer the tree trunks with its bill, digging out insects. The only interesting thing is, and this is really of no particular relevance to um, what we have to consider today, but it is, it is quite interesting, is that this, this finch is very, very rare in that um, it uses a tool. Unlike the woodpecker of the mainland, which has a very long tongue for sticking into the crevices between the bark, particularly once it's made holes, and getting the insects out, um, the, woodpecker, the, the, the woodpecker finch didn't have this long tongue. And so it used um, the spines of cactuses, or little small twigs, which it held in its beak and poked into the tree to get, to get the insects out. Once the insect was got out, it dropped the, tw the thing and, and out the insect. Now, that's often quoted as a, a very rare example of a, of a tool using bird. Um, and you don't, you don't come across this sort of thing very often. Um, but, in fact, it, <clears throat> Darwin's view was far broader than that. And he saw much more than focusing in on this, this particular unusual thing. What he focused on was the fact but in the Galapagos Islands, there were a whole range of finches, unlike any that he saw on the mainland, and occupying ways of life, what we sometimes call a biological niche, a way of life in which they were able to exploit food, in which they were able to exploit shelter, in which they were able to live in a way that no finches lived on the mainland. And what he concluded was this, that all these finches had developed from one or a few, maybe a few, um, ground finches that had found their way there from the mainland, maybe blown on a freak um, air current, had arrived at the islands, maybe it happened to quite a lot of finches that missed the islands altogether and never got anywhere, but they arrived on the islands. And then on the islands, as they developed, they were able to take advantage of new opportunities and they changed their body shapes and they changed their habits accordingly. Of course, any ground finch that had aspirations, and I'm being very anthropomorphic here, so please, um, please understand that this is just sort of a colloquial way of speaking. Any ground finch, any ground finch that had aspirations to become a woodpecker wouldn't get very far because they were perfectly good woodpeckers that were very well adapted to woodpecking and getting insects out of bark and so on, um, who would have elbowed them out straight away. So they would, it would never have got off the ground. So what Darwin actually came across and made very good use of was <laughs> this idea that there was development, adaptive radiation, as it's sometimes called, in, in the case of the, of, the, of the ground finches of the Galapagos. But he thought further than that, and he added to this a lot of the other observations that he'd made around the world. And he obviously also thought further and said, well, hang on. There's a woodpecker, a perfectly good woodpecker on the mainland. How did that get there? And of course, he then extended it to saying, well, these finches have developed to get to where they are. What about all the other organisms in the world? That woodpecker must have developed to get to where it is. And so what the voyage of the beagle did for Darwin was to introduce to him the idea that there was development of organisms that actually he'd seen some examples of. That organisms were not static, that they didn't stay the same all the time, they changed. 